You have reached the Geek Elite. Good luck. Video games are a unique medium. They can tell stories. Immerse us in strange, fantastic worlds. Blur the very boundaries of our reality. But at the end of the day, video games are fun. Whatever fun is to you. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I am Matt A.K.A. Stormageddon. And on Fun and Games, we talk about the history, trends, and community of video games. It's a celebration of all the games we play and all the fun we find within them. And there's so many more games out there. So we hope you'll share in that conversation with us. Fun and Games podcast with Matt and Jeff. Find us on certainpov.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And happy gaming. In my lifetime, I expect to see three, four, perhaps even more women on the high court bench. Women not shaped from the same mold, but of different complexions. Welcome back to another episode of United States of Women, and we are glad to welcome Lexi. Hello. Uh, As always, this is your women's history podcast on the Geek Elite Media Network, where I and Jessica discuss all of the women you don't know you know, and this season we are getting to have guests, which is so exciting, and Lexi is the perfect guest for today's episode. So today's episode, I am calling this woman, hold on, I want to get it, I want to get it right because it's a quote from a newspaper. I'm calling her the killer of millions of killers. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> it's always a good one. <laughs> right? I just, I find that very, reading the old newspaper articles were hysterical. I was like, you guys have no idea how to, how to like actually compliment women. <laughs> Were successful? No. <laughs> but it was highly did it even mention it was a woman? In the- <laughs> it did. It was an enti- It was entirely about her. However, and we'll get to this. Her discovery was first proposed to her by a man. Uh, of course, course. naturally, <laughs> it could not be her own idea. <laughs> heaven forbid. No, no, heaven forbid. Uh, but they did give her credit for actually doing all of the work. So, <laughs> and I will say it was probably a doctor, a male doctor, that gave her this idea. Just, probably. Mm-hmm. Probably. Uh, so today we are talking about Sarah Bronham Matthews. I think I'm pronouncing Bronham correctly, but I'm not actually sure. I have read it now all over the place, uh, but I never pronounced it or I never got a pronunciation of it anywhere. I guess everybody figured it's not that difficult to name, but they haven't met me. So... Uh (laughs) So Sarah Bronham was born July 25th, 1888 in Oxford, Georgia. Okay. Okay. To Sarah Stone and here's another name I'm going to butcher. Junius Bronham. Yeah, that's a that's a southern name. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I found really interesting in doing this in doing Sarah is all of her biographers specifically point out the fact that she was lucky to have grown up in a family that valued education in women for women. yeah like i i really appreciated like all of them talked about how she did the work she did those things but she took advantage of the unique opportunities provided to her which is like that's a really good way to discuss hard work plus privilege mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because for most women in the late 1800s Going to school would not have been a thing. Right. <laughs> no. Yeah. It would have been a, well, that's cute, honey. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, you, no, you went to find a husband. That was it. You went, yeah. never finished a degree. And if you did, it was an arts degree. <laughs> mm-hmm. You went for your Mrs. degree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Your MRS. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but her family highly valued education. Both of her grandfathers taught at the college she would eventually attend, Wesleyan, okay. in, in Georgia, where she received her BS in biology in 1907. Okay. Yeah. Now, despite being in a family that highly valued education for women, still wasn't many still weren't many jobs for women. Well, she wasn't in a world that valued. <laughs> yeah. So it was like this this disconnect. Um so she has deep ties to Wesleyan College and it'll keep coming up, so I want to talk about them a little bit. Both of her grandfathers taught there. Mm. One in physics, one in history. Ooh. 
her grand her grandmother went there. Her maternal grandmother went there, and wow. her mother went there. Wow. No. Oh. Yeah. So they really valued women in education. Yes. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. No. All, all over the place, left and right. So, upon leaving Wesleyan, really the only career she could pursue was to teach at the time. Yeah. So she started in Sparta, Alabama, and then Decatur, and finally ending up teaching high school biology and English in Atlanta at an all-girls high school. And this was 1917, so she did this for about a decade. 1917, looking globally, all of a sudden we have World War I. Mm-hmm. And she takes this opportunity while all of the men are off to war, to do, 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 kind of sn- not sneak her way in, but definitely take advantage of those opportunities. So she left Atlanta and enrolled at the University of Colorado in uh, their program to get a B. She would end up with a BS in chemistry and zoology okay. in oh. 1919. But upon her arrival in 1917, due to her intellect and her already having a degree in biology they actually hired her because they didn't have enough male staff first as a lab assistant and then as a teacher hmm. in the field of bacteria bacteriology bacteriology it would eventually become microbiology mm-hmm. it would yeah. just get kind of absorbed <laughs> but at that point it was called bacteriology um which was a department in the med school so she taught and completed her bs in chemistry and zoology throughout this time Uh, She would go on to state in several articles where they quote her, basically stating that, you know, by the end of World War I, I was in too deep. They couldn't get me out. Yep. (laughs) Just like, I'm here. Now you must live with me. (laughs) I'm staying. Uh, So in 19... beginning of 1919 after her graduation she would move to chicago to attend the university of chicago specifically to study the influenza pandemic of 1918-1919 very apropos for our current lives Mm -hmm. (laughs) and the whole reason we started this podcast Mm -hmm. yeah um and she would earn her phd in 1923 in the field of bacteriology she would teach throughout her time at the University of Chicago. Upon getting her PhD, she started med school at the University of Chicago. Because why not? Years. Yes, yep. But in 1927, she got um, plucked out of the University of Chicago to become an associate at the medical, sc- the, uh, medical school for the University of Rochester. Oh, Huh. Which is okay. where she would, she, so she was going there, she was going to finish her, her MD, and she was going to also be an associate. Wow. However, she was only there approximately three months. I have two months, I have three months, I've got four months, but about three months. Okay. Aww. When the United States Public Health Services Hygienic Laboratory <laughs> uh-huh. recruited her as a senior scient- or senior infectious disease scientist Mm -hmm. uh this has become the national institute of health yeah this is this has become an nih but she was recruited because there was an outbreak of meningococcus in california coming over from china so she was recruited to help deal with that Mm -hmm. epidemic and see what they could do about that okay uh overall her job title was covering basically all infectious diseases. Her job title included studying influenza, salmonella, shingilla, diphtheria, dysentery, and psittacosis. All the big, the big ones. Yeah. <laughs> so it's basically like, here, you do all the things. Yeah. All, all the infections. And work. meningitis. Here you go. Have fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so she would then... And it was during this time that she is credited with the discovery and isolation of, and I'm going to butcher this again, Neisseria meningitis, mm-hmm. Ooh. which 
this is where I'm probably going to lean mostly <laughs> on Lexi because I researched all the history for meningitis mm-hmm. and the WHO's, you know, information on meningitis, but I'm probably going to screw this up. So correct me when I get it wrong. Okay. Um, because for those listeners who don't know, Lexi is a registered, she's got, she's a nurse. She's an RN. She's yeah. an RN. She's yeah. a registered nurse. Um, <laughs> Very skilled, very talented. So when I screw this up, slash when I mispronounce things, please correct me. Because anybody who listens to any podcasts that I do, I mispronounce everything. everything. Well, to be fair, I've really only seen meningitis uh, like a handful of times in my career. So. <laughs> Which is a good thing. Good thing. Yes, That's no, a good thing. definitely a good thing. Our, our, either our healthcare system is working in some way. Yeah. So meningitis has been around basically forever. forever. Um there's indication, we think, in some of our Greek writing, in some of our Roman writing, mm-hmm. but the first time it was kind of classified as a thing of, of its own is, or described as its own individual disease was in 1805 by Gaspard Visux, Visux? Oh. in Geneva <laughs> huh. um, due to... Nice a uh, outbreak that was occurring at that time. Then in 1884, a couple of Italian pathologists described the cerebral spinal fluid infection Mm -hmm. that we now think of specifically for meningitis. But it wasn't until three years later in 1887 that Anton, and there are multiple last names I have for this man, (laughs) but the one I've seen more frequently than others, Wechselbaum okay. uh, made the connection between the two, that the bacteria and the infection found in the cerebral spinal fluid were the same thing. Hmm. Um, the first, tr- the first uh, diagnosis treatment uh, occurred in 1890 uh, with the lumbar puncture which is still what is most commonly used today to confirm meningitis. Mm -hmm. And that basically brings us up to where we're at when Sarah jumps in and starts looking at things. So here's the science portion, which I'm less certain of. (laughs) Uh, So meningitis is a big thing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is an infection of the men genes Mm -hmm. the membranes in the brain and spinal cord Mm -hmm. there are several types my count is there are like four major types yeah i mean all that stuff with the brain is kind of still it's like deep sea diving (laughs) like you still don't really know like 90 percent what's going on Uh down there but okay it's kind of what we're we know at this point um yeah the meninges 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 Meninges. that's too adorable yeah the term (laughs) yeah it's like i always think of it because it's an extension of like the like i always think of it like your phalanges so you got your meninges and your phalanges it's Are like they, the they're, they're the extension of the neurons, yeah. right? The very tippy, tippy, tippy. I mm-hmm. remember this now from neurology. Yeah, yeah meninges. <laughs> I remember saying that when I learned about it. Oh, meninges. <laughs> sure, sure thing. <laughs> a little like, I'm on the end and I do important things. <laughs> but yeah, so there, there are a few types. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, and they're all bacterial, right? The meningitis? Yes. No. No. Some are... There's a viral strain and a, and a bacterial strain. Okay. Um, one is better than the other. <laughs> well, one you want, one you don't want. <laughs> I was saying, so... Imagine the bacterial one is the better one. No. No. Really? Yes. So that's, that's the one piece I do have. Mm-hmm. Wow. So the type most likely to cause epidemics and has the highest mortality rate is the Neisseria meningitis which is what was discovered by sarah okay and reclassified as its own little the taxonomy was done on just that um Hmm. it is vaccine preventable but Mm -hmm. it is a gram negative bacterium which 
I have no idea what that actually means. It just kept popping up, so I put it in my notes. <laughs> um, it's not really... Uh, when you're talking about any kind of bacterium, it, it doesn't necessarily... No, it doesn't really matter to anyone except for the microbiologist and the pharmacist. <laughs> Got it. Because the microbiologist identifies it, so then the pharmacist knows what medication to give for it. So, yes. Okay. So that's, that's the other piece. So Sarah not only created the taxonomy for this particular, discovering it in her lab through multiple experiments in rats and then in larger animals. Mm -hmm. But she also discovered that the treatment needed to be different. So previously, for the other types of meningitis, they had been using anti-serums as a treatment. I I don't even know what that is. That's, but it's the late, it's, it's, sounds it's like the early 1900s. 1900s. Yeah. So yeah. Like, I'm gonna go with it with some weird. <laughs> basically, basically, I was. It seems like mostly inoculation, and they're just calling it anti serum treatment. Oh, okay. I don't know why, but that's that's what they're calling it. Huh. Um, but I mean, for she, the viral strain, that would be fine because it's a virus. <laughs> Um, but. So and it, yeah, and it it supposedly worked on all the other ones, but it was not working in this, which is why they had her working on this to begin with. Mm. Um, And she discovered that uh, newly established sulfa drugs Mm -hmm. would actually cure or treat it. Mm -hmm. Cure and treat it. Um, So this was, and the sulfa drugs were, the sulfa drugs that she identified were then basically used until 1941 when we get penicillin. And mm-hmm. then it's like, hey, look, <laughs> the glory of penicillin. A little <laughs> way mold. less side effects <laughs> and so much better outcomes. <laughs> Thank God for mold. <laughs> <laughs> but so Sarah was credited with the discovery, the taxonomy, and then uh, the treatment. And so this particular type of meningitis, Neisseria, they called it Neisseria catcheralis. Oh, I wouldn't even go. Just, catcheralis. <laughs> but in 1970, it was renamed as Bronamella catcheralis because of Sarah Bronman's. Oh, Aww, she got her name on it. Yes. That's they changed cool. the name on it. And it was officially accepted in the 1974 edition of Burgess Manual of Systemic Burgi- Bacteria. Burgess. Burgess? Just- Okay, it's definitely Burgess here. B- is it? B-E-R-G-E-Y-S. Oh, I've only ever heard it as Burgess. Maybe it, 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 it's probably now become Burgess because that sounds much more official uh. than Burgess. But, you know, it's it's Burgess Manual of Systematic Bacteriology. So probably about the time they went to microbiology, yeah, probably. they went to Burgess. <laughs> uh, so from her transfer over to what was what is now NIH um, she would stay there until she retired in 1958 uh, just four years before she'd pass oh. so she was there mm. for a very long time yeah um, she in 1932 however she took a or sorry in 1930 she represented the US at the first international convention of microbiology Oh, so she was, and she'd go back in 1936 to represent the U.S. in the second international oh, convention cool. on microbiology. In 1932, she took a leave of abs- a two-year leave of absence from the NIH to finish that medical degree at the University of Chicago. Good, because she, right. she's like, no, 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 I'm on. If I'm, I'm doing the work of the doctor, mm-hmm. I better get the recognition uh-huh. of being a doctor. Exactly. In 1939, she was an entire piece was done by the Atlanta Constitution, so the largest newspaper in um, Georgia at the time, mm-hmm. and that's where the uh, it was March 6, 1939, and the headline was "She Killed Millions of Killers." <laughs> Georgia-born woman doctor uncovers cure for the dread germ of meningitis. I mean that is a catchy that is a ca- really good catchy title. title. We need right? to bring back good titles. <laughs> so that is where the title for today's episode comes from because I was just like that was hilarious, and then of course like you read it and like they're like wow a woman is capable of this. Also, she was talking with uh, Sh- Doctor Shearborn, and he was the one who suggested that she test this theory in rats. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, but that's yeah, not I'm sure he that's did. not him saying this is what to do. That's her saying this is what I need to do, and he's like, do it on rats. That's not him going. What if we did this and this, and her going, oh, I can do that on rats? No, it's <laughs> it yeah. was completely her idea, and he's just like, yeah, we got some rats in the back for it. <laughs> so. Um, then in 1945, she married Philip Matthews, although she would never use his last name professionally. She continued professionally to go by Sarah Bronman, but legally changed her name to Sarah Bronman Matthews. Um, Philip would unfortunately pass in 1949, so it was very Very short. short. Then come all the accolades. All the accolades. So, in... 1950, Wesleyan College began uh, awarding a Distinguished Service Award to its alma mater, to its, al- uh, to its alum, and mm-hmm. she was the first to receive it in 1950. Oh. She also received the same award from the University of Chicago. Mm. Rightfully so. She reserved, she earned an honorary doctorate from the University of Denver. <laughs> Rightfully so. Uh-huh. Uh, she was then in 1955 uh, promoted to Chief of Bacterial Toxins of the Division of Biological Standards at the NIH. Oh my gosh, mm-hmm. what a title! Uh, where she would, which is the post she would hold till she retired in 1958. By the time of her retirement, she had authored over 80 papers. Wow. Which I attempted to read several of them. Oh no! Oh, not no. gonna Don't lie, I could not. I, Don't I, read microbiology papers. I tried. I wanted to know. It's a whole lot you're of Greek. Not gonna know. Not it's a lot of Latin. anything else. No need. The Latin would be fine. It's all the Greek that's the okay, issue. Okay, yeah, Greek yeah. is pretty hard. Um, and she would eventually pass on November sixteenth, nineteen sixty-two. So, that is the story of Sarah Bronham Bronaham. And meningitis. Meningitis. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. But yeah. What an accomplished woman. Like, right? I know you do a lot of accomplished women, but like, as a person in the medical community, that is a lot of stuff to do. <laughs> I know. I'm looking like, man. I've taken I- microbiology classes. I know how much work that is. <laughs> well, I like the microbiology. I'm like, okay, you got, you got a BS in biology. Okay, mm-hmm. you got a BS in chemistry. What is the BS in zoology? Is she just like, oh, that sounds fun. Like, she seems like the kind of I person. Would legit that, do that. Well, so, yeah, she I'm seems like, like my kind of person. Like, where I'm like, just eh. take a zoology. I wonder. Degree. I wonder if that has a lot to do with like the time period too. Like, it's the early 1900s. No, I mean we're just like on the cusp of figuring out what germs <laughs> are. So I wonder if maybe she was like, well, if I'm gonna study germs, I might as well study like animals and germs and they do go together <laughs> fairly well i mean i mean she fair. had to study the the organism on something and it happened to be a rat so she needs to know the difference between a human and a rat so yeah valid this is valid <laughs> okay our heart rates are different our breathing rates are different <laughs> like, i'm just like i'm going zoology seems really weird for microbiology but you are right you're correct so Mm. Yeah. Wow. I'm that impressed. Is. Right? Cool. I mean, I was going to be impressed anyway, but she, I, she's very <laughs> impressive. The time that we had back then, though, like, she just... If we didn't have internet or anything, like, do you think I could be just covering the cure-all for a brain meningitis? <laughs> just... No, I could not. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I mean, it would be really interesting. It definitely would be way more in college. Like, I would have a lot more degrees if it wasn't for the internet. That is true. I'm a thousand percent sure I would just live at a college. <laughs> <laughs> no, so She's amazing. Yeah. She I kind of want, like, a big docuseries on her. Right? Actually. like Would be helpful. I kind of want to know more about her personal life more yes. than anything. Like, she sounds amazing. There was only one biography I could find. Mm. Like, like full biography that I could find. But she um, did so much. Right? Which was, it was so stunning to me that that's all it was. Yeah, she's but. definitely a good example of why we started this podcast of, like, no idea she existed. Yeah. No idea. But she did so much and deserves so much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And we've all heard of meningitis and the horrors that it wreaks. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Although I was interested to learn that most people who 
die from meningitis don't die from meningitis they die from sepsis mm-hmm. uh-huh. which makes sense i mean I, I get it it's the same thing with like yeah, pneumonia well, but once you read the like how meningitis affects your body it makes a lot more sense as to why it's sepsis as opposed to meningitis yeah, well, yeah no. my, my grandfather actually died of brain meningitis but they didn't know it till after he died because he had cancer though at oh, the time okay. like he had a brain cancer and i think oh. it led to meningitis mm-hmm. somehow and they didn't know it till after he died yeah. either because he was dealing with so many other stuff but dealing with so much else and you don't really go poking around in the brain unless you absolutely have to yeah, yeah pretty much like they didn't even think to do the tests or anything for it because of what was going on but yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. well so that is sarah bronman matthews um citations for today uh the Wesleyan Magazine, uh, in the winter of 2015, did a pretty awesome article on Sarah Brown Matthews entitled The Grand Lady of Microbiology, which I thought was a pretty <laughs> awesome title. That is awesome. Um, the Oxford Historical Society's uh, article on Sarah Bronman. One bio- biographical sketch by Margaret Pittman entitled Sarah Elizabeth Bronman, parentheses Matthews, a biographical sketch. That one was actually hard to access. I had to, like go find a library i was gonna say you didn't have to be like buy a subscription to a magazine or something did you i have other methods (laughs) (laughs) that is that is essentially what it would call for um and then for meningitis uh the who's website the cdc's website an article entitled the history of meningitis by dr anai mandal mandal Hmm. were most of my major sources awesome so well Lexi thanks for coming on the podcast yeah, thank, thank you. you for having me this was a lot of fun and I got to learn something that I didn't know <laughs> well and thank you for correcting me <laughs> on pronunciations of medical terms because I mean, it was sure. just the one thing that's pretty impressive I have to say <laughs> and like, it's always difficult because everyone says stuff differently depending <laughs> on the regions too <laughs> And say, I, I would I would like this this piece of the recording to be saved and played back for every time I get teased about not being able to pronounce other things. I just say, just saying, because I did work really hard to try and figure out how to pronounce these things. Because I was like, these are, yeah, it's um, these are just random letters shoved together. Medical mm-hmm. jargon is that is that just a lot of jargon thrown together. So, and thank you for the insight on how it all works in the medical anytime (laughs) so jessica if people want to reach out to you to discuss poking around in brains where can they find you you can find me on twitter as jm bailey writes and lexi do you want to give out any social media i have nothing so (laughs) (laughs) solid so you can find lexi and me (laughs) with the rest of geek elite media at geek elite media and our facebook page forward slash geek elite media Archived episodes of this podcast and other podcasts can be found on geekelitemedia.com. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe on whatever podcatcher you use. It helps spread the word about our network. If you've got a couple extra dollars, please run on over to our Patreon page. We're going to have several extra episodes pop up from this podcast as well as some of the other podcasts. Uh, There's always new stuff out there. Until next time, this is the United States of Women saying, always remember to geek out. (laughs) This concludes our broadcast.